If you want to open your Bibles for into the New Testament, I'm going to be reading in just a moment from the first chapter of Paul's letter to the little church at Ephesus, 1 Ephesians, the first chapter, and uh, I apologize that we don't have it up on the screen. I didn't really decide what I was going to preach until last night. Um, so I made it a little difficult on Becky to get the information to the, the crew about uh, the passage for the scripture today. This is a, a, an introduction like most of Paul's letters have an introduction. He's in prison. He's writing to this small church in Ephesus. And in the first six verses of the opening first chapter, he gives sort of an introduction like he does always. And then he talks about the position that we hold in the eyes and heart of God. In the fourth verse, I'm going to read in a moment, he has a verb. In the fifth verse, a verb. A sixth verse, a verb. And those three verbs are the points that Paul's trying to make, and they're going to be the points that we go over this morning. So beginning in chapter 1 of Ephesians, I'm going to read from the first verse through the sixth verse. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from our God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Verse 4, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, in verse 5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. In verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts prove acceptable in your sight. For you are our strength, O Lord. Amen. Verse 4 says that God chose us before the foundation of the world was laid. Verse 5 is in the noun form here in the King James Version, predestined unto the adoption, but it is the basic idea that we have been adopted by God. So in verse 4, we're chosen by God. In verse 5, we are adopted by God. And then finally in verse 6, he says that we are accepted by God. We don't talk about that a whole lot in church. That we are accepted by God. So this morning, I want to take each one of those three and talk about them briefly with you. I want to focus mostly on the accepted part of it, because that's so hard for us to comprehend. But I'm going to begin with the very first thing Paul talks about, and that is that we are chosen by God before the foundation of the world was laid. Now, what does Paul mean by that? Are we like being chosen on team sports? You know how you divide up two captains and you get the... PE class to line up and you, we're going to play dodgeball and each captain starts picking and selecting, choosing someone to be on their team. Back and forth and back and forth it goes. Is that what Paul means when he says that God chose us before the foundation of the world? Was there another group of people apparently he didn't choose? Maybe the Baptist, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, brother. <clears throat> nothing, nothing personal. <laughs> but what is, what is Paul trying to say here? Because when you get behind the English translation that we have in the King James I read and most of the other modern 
translations as well that, that were chosen by God, that's not really what Paul's talking about at all. Paul is talking about a master artist, a master craftsman, a great artisan who is so good at what he does that nobody else is his equal. And this master craftsman individually and specifically designed each one of you and me before the foundation of the world was laid. That's the image that's here in the Greek language of a master craftsman, a master, say, a locksmith at work, making a master key that only fits one particular lock. It only has one specific purpose. And Paul is saying that before God even created the heavens and the earth, before the foundation of the world was laid, God thought about you, God knew your name, knew who you would be, where you would live, when you would live. He thought about you and specifically and individually designed you just like a master key with a purpose in mind. You were thought of. You were specifically designed by God with a purpose for your life. For some people, it's unlocking a door, a pathway, so that others can follow in their lead and, and many more can come to Christ. For some, it's unlocking one particular simple thing in the body of their uh, believing church. There's just one simple gift that they've been given by God before the foundation of the world was laid and if they grow up and if they use that gift and if that gift is put to use it will unlock something extraordinary in the life of that church or that community maybe you are to unlock your spouse uh, yeah exactly Maybe the reason that you were put on this earth was to unlock something in your spouse so that they can use the gifts and the graces that God specifically designed them for. And you're that trigger mechanism. We're going to leave it for there. We're going to leave it right there. But the idea that Paul is trying to get to in this passage is not that you were just chosen by God and, you know, therefore you're on the team. The idea is that you were specifically thought about and designed by a master craftsman with a specific purpose in mind. And the purpose of this church is for every single individual to find out what that purpose is for their life and to fulfill it. Let me give you an illustration. Suppose that you have gone to an antique store and you have bought an old antique roll-top desk. It's not in the best of shape, but it's in pretty good shape. You bring it home, you refinish it, you paint it or whatever you want to do, get it all ready. But you really want a key to lock and unlock your new roll top desk. And you don't have any of the old skeleton type keys at home, so you go to a master locksmith in town and you sit down and you tell him about your roll top desk and that you want to, now that you've finished redoing it and you want to bring it inside and you want a key that you can have and keep to lock it and unlock it as you see fit. And uh, the old locksmith, he says, well, you know, I don't really have very many of those old skeleton keys around anymore. I don't really need them anymore. And he said, uh, but, you know, he said, I've got this big old pile of keys back in the storeroom behind me, and and it's just a whole bunch of junk keys and... and uh, he said, you're welcome to dig around in there if you'd like and see if you can find a key that will 
you know, one of those old skeleton keys that might just happen to lock and unlock your roll-top desk, and if you find it, that's great, you can have it, and if you don't, maybe I can come by your house sometime and stop and uh, craft you a key that would fit that old roll-top desk. So you go back in the back. You go back in the storeroom, and sure enough, big pile of keys... Old keys, new keys, used keys, brand new keys, keys with the teeth worn off, they've been used so many times, bent keys, every color key you can imagine, some old skeleton keys, some old antique keys are there. And you start digging around, and as you do, God speaks to you. And God says, you see those keys? That's my church. You stop and you think about it for a minute. God says, no, really, that, that pile of keys is, is my church. And you begin to see the enormity of the task of ministry in a church if the purpose of ministry is for every single one of those individuals who were specifically and individually crafted, designed by God before the foundation of the world, if every single one of those individuals that are a part of the church are going to find out the purpose for which they were made and unlock the lock that they were meant to open. And church is an extraordinary place. What an amazing task. Now, I brought my keys this morning. I, you know, there's nothing fancy about them. But this, this light blue key here in the back, it's the key that opens the uh, garage door of our house. So I use it fairly often. Not every day, but I use it fairly often. It gets a pretty good amount of use. This other darker blue key here, this is the key to the back deck door of our home. I don't know if I've ever used it. <laughs> Might have used it once or twice, I don't know. But it just sits here on the ring. But imagine this morning that keys can talk to one another. And I've just pulled into my garage and my truck and I've taking the ignition key out of the ignition and I've gotten out of the truck and I'm, I'm holding this back door key that I use fairly frequently. I'm walking up toward the, the back door to unlock it and go in and this other key speaks first, the one that I never use. It says, huh, I just sit here on this ring and I don't count for anything. He never calls on me. He never uses me. I don't even know why I show up. I don't have anything to do over there. And then the, the back door key that I'm holding my fingers around, it, it speaks as I insert it into the lock. And it goes, huh? Boy, that feels good. He certainly can't get along without me over there. Boy, I tell you, it feels great to be used all the time. And when you hear those kinds of attitudes, it brings to home the ridiculousness of jealousy and competitiveness and power grabbing and viciousness that we've all seen in churches before. If you're specifically and individually crafted by Almighty God with a purpose in mind, then we need to be finding out what that purpose is. Paul secondly talks about adoption. He says, 
You've been adopted into the family of God. So he goes from having a a specific purpose, a specific place, a specific use in God's eyes to having a specific place in his family. And it has everything to do with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross and it has absolutely nothing to do with our own goodness. And I'm not going to preach about adoption this morning because it's a sermon top subject that we preach on just about every week. Every time we talk about what Christ did for us to bring us into God's family while we were yet sinners. But I do want to focus on acceptance this morning. The third point Paul makes. Because Paul wants you to know that in God's eyes, in God's heart, you are accepted just like you are. Don't hear that in church very often, do you? You are accepted by God just like you are. God not only designed you and knew why you were going to be born and brought you into his family, but now he's going to accept you just like you are. And we don't get that very often in life. We don't get it at home. We don't get it at school. We don't get it at church an awful lot. We don't find many places in life where we can go where people just accept us just as we are. They're not trying to change us. They're not trying to improve us. They're not trying to get rid of us. They're not trying to do anything. They just like us like we are. And we feel that acceptance. Well, we don't feel it that often, if we're honest. But Paul wants you to know that God accepts you just like you are. So I'm going to tell you a little story. It has to do with a couple that wants to adopt a child. And they have two children of their own, natural children that they created and brought onto this wonderful planet. Those two kids are in elementary school and they're off at school and mom and dad have decided they want to adopt a third child. Bet mine wish they had done that since I'm the third. Um. So they go to the adoption agency, they fill out the paperwork, they spend all the required time to do the things that are necessary to adopt a child and Finally, the day comes that they're scheduled to come in and talk to the director again, and they're supposed to, in this particular conversation, let the director know what kind of child they would like to adopt. And it's common for most families that are going to adopt a child to have some idea in the back of their mind of the type of child they want. Do they want a boy? Do they want a girl? Do they want a particular race, do they want a particular nationality, do they want to wait however long it's going to be required to wait for an infant, or do they want, are they willing to take a child that's a little older? So they go to the adoption agency, they sit down with the director to have this conversation about the type of child they want to adopt, what their preferences are. And the director asks them, what, what is your preference? I know you've thought about it and prayed about it. What kind of child do you want to adopt? And the husband looks at the director and he says, we've talked about this and we've prayed about it and we've decided we want the most difficult case that you have. Whatever the situation is, whether it's a boy or a girl, doesn't matter, whatever the situation, we want the most difficult case that you have. And the director had opened this drawer of files of the kids that were there in the facility right now, and he closed it back up, and he reaches behind his desk, and he grabs an old file, and he pulls it around, and he says, if you want the most difficult case I have, this is it. 
It's a little boy, and he's seven years of age, and he lives here at the adoption agency. He came to us a little after he was two and a half from an abusive home where there was drug abuse and violence in the home and domestic abuse, and the child was abused as well. And it was so bad that by the time he was a little older than two and a half, they had to pull him out of the home and and bring him here, and we have not been able to place him anywhere. The boy has a deformed foot, and it's a it's a partially a birth defect, but it's also partially a result of what happened in that home. But he has this deformity, and he can't walk. He couldn't walk regularly when other kids were walking, and he couldn't run when other kids were running, and. That led to additional abuse that took place in the house, and because of that, he often wakes up at night screaming, crying in the middle of the night, waking up from bad dreams of what happened in his home. So all this is going on underneath the surface of this young seven-year-old boy. But you also need to understand that one of the problems he has is that we only keep children here in the adoption agency for two, three, sometimes as as long as four or five months at a time before a family comes and adopts them or they're placed in a foster home or they're placed in some other way. But this boy has been with us for four and a half years. And for four and a half years, he has watched couple after couple after couple after couple come into the agency, look for the particular type of child that they want to adopt, find that child, adopt that child, go home with that child, and no one has ever come here and asked for him. And he knows it. He's been here four and a half years, and nobody loves him enough to take him home. So that's what you're going to be dealing with if you want the most difficult case I have. And they say, that's the boy we want. So they go back home and they start making their preparations for his getting his room ready and doing all the things that are a part of the process. And the agency does a thorough background search on them and every aspect of their lives. And the process continues to unfold fine until finally the day comes that the couple is to arrive back at the adoption agency in the director's office once again, and this time to sign the papers, write the check, pay the fee that's required to adopt the child and adopt this young boy. So they go. Now the director's office is a lot like a principal's office was when I was growing up in school where... You know, the principal's office, the wall came up about halfway. And then it was glass above that so that the principal could see out into the hallway. I guess this was back when we had discipline in in the hallways. And they actually wanted to know what was going on out there. And so they go into the director's office and they're filling out the final bit of paperwork and they're writing the check and they write the check out and they sign it and they give it to the director and they pay the fee that's required to adopt this boy. And they look through the window and the playroom is right next to the director's office and you can see into it and there's this little boy. Looks like he's about seven years old and he's got one little tiny suitcase with him that holds everything he owns in the world and he's standing there on his tippy toes looking up, trying to look into the director's office to see the face of the couple that has finally come to adopt him. And they go through all the requirements that are scheduled for that day and finally it's time for mom and daddy to go into the little playroom and sit down and talk to the boy for a minute and then get his suitcase and him and take him home. So they do. They put the suitcase in the back seat, put the boy in the back seat, and I want to give you two scenarios. Scenario number one. They get in the car and they try to awkwardly talk a little bit, but they basically don't on the way back to the 
house and when they get there they pull in and turn the car off and dad gets out of the driver's side and goes around and tells the little boy to come on out the back seat and he gets out of the back seat and grabs his little suitcase and he's coming down the sidewalk and he's stumbling a little bit because he's got that deformed foot and the dad looks at him and says all right now hurry on let's go inside and we're going to talk for just a minute before we show you your room so they go inside and they sit down and the conversation goes something sort of like this the dad says um we're, we're excited to have you. And we're glad that you're here. And we wanted to tell you before anything else happens today and we get further into the day that we have two children of our own. They're our natural children. And they're at school right now. But they're excited and they're, they can't wait till you get home this afternoon um, so that they can meet you and play with you. And, but we just wanted to remind you that, that we already have two children here that are our own children that live in the house. So please be respectful. And I understand I've been told about your deformity, your foot. Um, and we s- certainly are going to make some allowances for that but we still expect you to do your best all the time. We're going to provide for you and clothe you and feed you and help you get educated and do everything that we possibly can to support you and and be there for you, but we do want you to do your best while you're here. And we know sometimes that you wake up at night and you're scared because of the home that you came from and we know that sometimes you want to scream or cry out in the middle of the night and and I hope that you will understand that you're safe now so you can just stop that. And I don't really have to say a whole lot about that scenario other than to say, and I want you to hear me very carefully, if you don't hear anything else this morning, hear this. That that scenario is rather precisely how an awful lot of Christians in church every single Sunday feel that God thinks about them. As if God were to say to you, I know about your stumbling, I know about your sin. And I'll make a certain allowance for that, but I expect you to do your best. And I know that you're scared. I know that you wake up sometimes at night and think about what you've done and whether or not you're going to end up in heaven or hell. But if you find yourself wanting to scream or cry in the night, you're safe now. I've adopted you into my family. Just stop it. And the loving, merciful, accepting heart of God never comes through. We sing the hymns. We enjoy the worship. We grow in class. But deep down inside, we're just not good enough for God to accept us. Not after what we've done. Scenario two. They go into the little playroom Dad picks the boy up in his arms. Mom grabs the suitcase. They go out to the car. They put the boy in the suitcase in the back seat, and off they go toward the house. Once again, they get out of the car, and we're going to pick up there with scenario two. The little boy is struggling. He's trying to make it down the sidewalk, so the daddy walks back and 
grabs the little suitcase and kind of lifts him a little bit into one arm and they take him inside and sit him down in the living room. And the dad begins and he says, you cannot imagine how long we have waited for you to be here. You cannot imagine how excited we are to have you as part of our family and to be in our home. We have two kids that we could barely get to school this morning because they were so excited that they were going to have a little brother to play with when they got home. And we've talked to a physician friend of ours from church and we took him your medical records and we talked about your foot and he says, and this will be entirely up to you, but he says that if you're willing, he's got a brace that he can attach to your leg to help straighten out that foot. And if you're willing to wear it, it might be several months, might even be a couple of years, but if you're willing to put up with that, he promised us that the day would come when you would not only walk like the other children, but you would run and play like the other children. And while we were preparing to come get you, we went and we found a carpenter. Your room's going to be right next to our room. And we had a carpenter cut a door between your room and our room. And as soon as you get settled in your room and you get used to living here, we hope that if you wake up at night and you're scared and you want to scream, if you don't get to us first, we'll be in there in your room. But you feel free to come run, jump right in our bed because we want you to know that we are going to take care of you and we love you and you're safe. Now that's the God that Paul is talking about who knew you before the foundation of the world was laid and specifically, individually designed you just like a master craftsman with a purpose in mind. And God has adopted you and brought you into his family out of complete grace. Jesus paid the price. You get in free. But God also accepts you just like you are. And he wants you to know that he's aware of the fear. And he's got a remedy for that. And he's aware of your stumbling, but he's got a, problem, a solution for that as well if you're willing to abide by it. And he wants you to know that one day you'll not only walk like his other children, not only will you run and play with his other children, but you'll mount up with wings of eagles and you'll fly. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that you have not only designed us, thought about us, adopted us, but that you have accepted us as we are. Lord, we thank you for all of your generous mercies. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.